Claudia Eisen for like that. And a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam McGuire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All-Ireland Champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to episode 29 of the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined as always by Star Sport editor Kieran McCarthy. On today's show we'll be looking ahead to, the, to Sunday's All-Ireland Minor Football Final between Cork and Galway and speaking to Cork manager Bobby O'Dwyer. We'll also chat to Evie Fitzgerald, who stepped down as Cork Ladies Football Manager following their All-Ireland semi-final loss to Dublin on Sunday. Later in the show, we'll also preview the West Cork League, which kicks off this weekend with a full round of fixtures in the Premier Division and the Championship. But first, Kieran, we have to look at Sunday's minor All-Ireland final. And no one could have predicted their own Bobby O'Dwyer side would have had this season when they were soundly beaten by Kerry earlier in the year. Yeah, very true, Jack. Go back to the start of May, I think it was up in Parky Ring on a Tuesday night. Kerry 319, Cork 19. That was a what, 16 point hammering. And it looked pretty ominous at that stage, to be quite honest with you. But um, even talking to the Bobby Dwyer after that defeat, he was kind of adamant that the, this Cork team is a lot better than they showed that night. They were missing a good few players and um, they just wanted to get back on the horse. And they did that against Clare. Um, I think it was a week later they beat Clare and that got them through to the Munster final. And with the Munster minor football championship, um, when you get through to the Munster final, you're guaranteed an All Ireland quarter final spot as well. So um, in that Munster final, Jack, we were there. We've spoken about it before. Cork ran Kerry to three points, three fourteen to two fourteen, and you could start to see, Jesus, this team is a lot better than they showed in the first game. Um, they were starting to get their players back. Like we mentioned before Michael O'Neill from Bodavent, he played half um, 30 minutes against Kerry in the Munster final. The likes of Jack Lawton, um, players like that who missed the, the first game, they were all starting to come back. And Cork were finally injury free and starting to find their best team. And the first time Cork Miners put out an injury, they had a fully fit outfield selection to choose from was for the All Ireland quarter final against Monaghan. Um, and they hockeyed them 319 to 210. Like, that was a real statement of intent. Um, Monaghan were the Ulster champions, so for Cork to go and beat them by 12 points was some going. And then they've continued on that form. They beat a very good Mayo team in the in the semi final by 412 to 113. And all of a sudden, after losing by 16 points to Kerry in the first game, the Cork Miners find themselves in an All Ireland final, ironically, against a Galway team that beat Kerry in that other semi final. So um, you, have a, you have a Cork and Galway final, and Two of them are both beaten provincial finalists too. So it's kind of an interesting one. Uh, well, other than the Galway victory over Kerry, do we know much else about this Galway team? Who who, who are going to be favourites lining out on Sunday? Uh, it's, a, it's a tough one. They've, uh, like, like we'll hear from Bobby now soon, and like he mentions that they, they've met in two challenge games, so they kind of know each other well. Um, I'm not sure how much you can ever take from a challenge game, but Cork have some idea of what they're up against. Um it's it's a it's a Galway team. Sorry, that doesn't concede too much. Um, go, go back through their their uh, their um their run through Connacht. They conceded one ten against Sligo, eleven points against Mayo, one four against Leitrim. Um, or in quarter final, they conceded fifteen points against Kildare and only thirteen points against Kerry in their Ireland semi finals. So they don't concede too much. Um, like all Galway teams, you're going to presume and assume that they're. They're good footballers. They're skillful footballers. So they will, they will pose Cork a, a fair few problems. But this is a Cork team, kind of high in confidence now, kind of injury free, playing good football. Um, so yeah, so Cork should be full of confidence going into this game. And I, I'd fancy Cork to win this, Jack. And um, seeing how much they've grown and developed over the last couple of months, it's um, when you consider actually that the Munster Minor Football Championship was revamped this year. Um, if, if you go back to previous years, Cork were always a team that ranked Kerry very, very close. But if Cork were unlucky enough to lose by a point or two to Kerry in a Munster semi-final, um, their season was over. So maybe after two games, that was it. The Cork Miners were they were packed up and put away till the following year. But because um, a new revamped Munster Championship was introduced this year and Cork and Kerry were put in phase two, along with the phase one winners who were clear, it just guaranteed Cork extra games. And in terms of developing these young fellas, like kind of, they'll be after what, six games now at the end of Sunday, you know, kind of, and looking at the bigger picture, 
it's, that's that's priceless for for these young fellas and um there's some very very good footballers there like the Connor Corbett the captain and a uh, um, like I said, Jack Lott and Keelan Scannell from Carby Rangers is another fella. Um, Dan Linehan is the defender who scored that screamer against um, against uh, against um, Mayo in the in the semi final. You see, forty five yards out, got the ball. Like he's played full back, I think he was centre back that day. Got the ball, bomb forward at an angle, top corner. Kind of you wouldn't see it in a in a World Cup final. Um, so no, kind of yeah, it's an impressive young Cork team. Hopefully they can finish the job. Well, it's something to look forward to for all the Cork football fans this Sunday. That'll, of course, act as the curtain raiser for the All-Ireland Senior Football Final between Dublin and Kerry. And I guess it'll probably be broadcast on TG Catter. TG Catter, yeah. And it's and one, 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock throw-in, yeah. 1 o'clock, yeah. Uh, well, we look forward to seeing that on Sunday and we'll have full build-up to the game on Thursday, Southern Star. But for now, let's chat to Cork Minor Football Manager, Bobby O'Dwyer. Bobby, a couple of days out from... The All Ireland Minor Football Final on Sunday. Is the feel of this week different to, to every other week, or do you try and treat it the same as any other week in the build up to a game? I know it's it look clear. It's it's an exciting time, and it's uh, it's the week before in All Ireland. But it's it's we're, we're treated as exactly the same. We're, we're coming up to play a game on Sunday, and we're just trying to keep everything as calm and and, and as relaxed as as ever. So yeah, look, we're just trying to keep it the same as every other week. I presume that that's very important too when you're dealing with minors because we're talking about 16, 17 year olds and just trying to, I presume, play down the game is probably important too. So, as in not to build it up too much? Yeah, well, I, I, look, they're, they're a great bunch of young lads. They live enough and they're played now this week. They're all headed back to school. So, there's plenty of exciting times for them as well. So, there's there, there are plenty of other things on their mind. Uh, but, but but at the back of the head, then, is the, 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 the big game on Sunday. But these young lads, they're, they're great. They don't have the fear that we have uh, as as older as older guys. So, all they want to do is go and play football. So, look, exciting times for everybody. Before we look at Sunday's final against Scarlet, Bobby, just a quick look back at the journey. I suppose this Cork team has been on. Um, they've grown, matured, evolved, improved throughout this campaign. Even if you go back to May in, in that, that first uh, game, that, that last uh, carry in Park, you ring. I remember talking to you after, and you were adamant that the team was a lot better than what they showed that night, and you've improved right. Kind of, can you talk to me about how the team has grown from that, from that first game against Kerry? Yeah, that was uh, that was certainly a, a chasing experience the first day. But uh, I, I suppose, uh, uh, as you and I spoke about at the time, uh, we were down four or five players going into that game, and uh, it, 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 it was always a big ask going into uh, play the, the All Ireland champions uh, without uh, four or five of your key players. Uh, a particular miss to us the, the, the first day, I suppose, was was the, our midfielders. Uh, they, they were both missing, uh, and that. You need a midfield to, to kind of to set a platform, but then as as the year went on, the first time that we had everybody uh, 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 or all the outfield players available was the All Ireland quarter final against uh, against Monaghan. And I guess as you're getting players back and they're getting used to the of the way the lads are playing, getting used to playing with each other again, it just takes that little bit of time. But I suppose most of us we've been involved with these lads since they were under 14. And uh, like we, we knew the quality was there, and we knew the ability was there, and you, you you've got to get that bit of momentum and that bit of confidence as well. And I suppose as the games have gone on, they're getting that. And the, the longer you can play football during the summer, it's 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 the more experience you have, the, the better the team kind of gels together. And as I say, confidence builds momentum, and momentum builds confidence. And look, we're 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 playing again now next Sunday, so that's the story so far. Like you said there, Bobby, I suppose the, the performances and the results have definitely improved as the season's progressed from the, like you said there, beating Monaghan 3-19 to 2-10, and then beating Mayo in the All-Ireland semi-final by 4-12 to, to 1-13, two really, really good performances. What's been the most pleasing aspect of the Cork play for you? Well, I, I, I suppose it's, it's, it's the way that everybody's playing, playing very well together. They're, they're, they're playing as a team. There's nobody... That, that that's one of the key things that we would try to have worked with the lads all year is, is the importance of team and how everybody contributes to that team and and, and uh, nobody is above the, the the whole team and they're they're a great group of of, of young men and they all buy buy into that attitude the the work rate the work rate of our forwards has been excellent it's it's the work rate of our midfielders and giving us primary position uh, possession and I suppose the 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 ability of our backs to to reduce the number of scores that are going in against us so all in all it's just everybody pulling together and uh, once everybody pulls together you've got a chance in the game. 
How surprised are you that it's Galway that Cork are facing on Sunday? I think the Kerry were, were, were they going for, for, for six in a row this year, was it? Um, kind of, and Galway got the better of them in the this, in, in this semi-final. How surprised are you that it is Galway that you're facing? Well, I, I suppose, in fairness, uh, Kerry would have been favourites for that game, but uh, the other side of it, uh, Karen, is, is I, I'm not overly surprised because it's a very, very good Galway team. We've we played Galway twice. Um, uh, I think people tend to forget that uh, Galway last year were in the All-Ireland final and Kerry beat them in the, in, in the final. And as I said, we, we played Galway twice this year and it, my own opinion was that they were the most improved team from the first time we played them to the second time that we played them. Uh, and they've they been very, very good. They've, they've, there's some excellent scoring forwards and they've a very, very good defensive system. So we really have to be uh, at our sharpest to make sure that, uh, that, that that we deal with what they throw at us the next day. How much can you learn from challenge games like that, Bobby? Like you said, you played them twice kind of over the year in challenge games. Can you take a lot from those? Uh, it, 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 it really depends. It really depends, Karen, because uh, it, it depends on what, how many of the actual team are going to be playing because quite regularly in challenge games, you'll, uh, you'll be missing players either through injury or with club games or, or, or whatever. But it does, <clears throat> what it does do is it, it, it helps you identify who, uh, who some of their key players are and it helps you identify a, st- a style that either yourself play or, or your opponents play. And every single opponent you play has a different style. And you probably have to set up your own team a, a little bit differently uh, to, to deal with that. You, know, you, you, you always focus on yourself and your own and your own structures first. But then every, every other team will have a different style. And it's, it, it's good. These games are very, very good. Um, An inter-county game has a particular pace and intensity you may not see in a, in a different game. So overall, they're very helpful. Obviously, Cork Park is going to be absolutely hopping on on Sunday with the the Kerry and Dublin senior final to kind of to come afterwards. But for for these young Cork players, they have played a semi final against Galway in Cork Park. Like they've had the the feel of Cork Park, the taste of it. They've run out on the pitch. They've seen the dressing rooms beforehand. How much would that help them? That familiar that familiarity for the for the final on Sunday. Oh, there, there's no doubt it is it is a help and it's a help for everybody. It's a help for the players and it's a help for the management mm-hmm. because it is it is quite different in their uh, a, a common comment by the players the last days when you're actually inside in the stadium how small the pitch looks uh, which you know a, a football pitch is going to be the same size no matter where you are uh, by and large there might be a couple of meters of a difference but because of the size of the stadium around it when you're actually standing in the pitch the pitch itself looks quite small but the 45 meter line is still 45 <laughs> meters from the goal the 20 meter line is still 20 meters from the goal but uh, you know, it, it really does throw you out when you go in there first uh, the, 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 I tell the story. I, I was sitting beside Danny Lennon uh, on, on the way up to the game the last day, and I was asking, had he been in Croke Park before? And uh, he was telling me he had never in his life been inside in Croke Park. And then, then he goes on and, and he scores a, a wonderful goal uh, against Mayo the last day. So look, the, these boys, they, they'll seize the moment and all have the fear and we encourage the lads to play without fear so so they're, we're really looking forward to the game the next day Brilliant I know the team has been named this Thursday but I'll be just checking kind of injury wise and so on how are, how are you fixed? I, look everybody everybody is fit and everybody's we've, we've, we've a lot of young lads there trying to put their hand up to make sure that they're part of the team uh, for, for, for next uh, Sunday whether that's on the starting 15 or on the panel of, of, of 24 so everybody, everybody is keen to make their to, to to put, and they're just such a wonderful group of young lads, and the toughest part of our job is 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 talking to the young lads who are not going to make the the, the match day squad, but the 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 ability of the lads who will be playing has been upped considerably in the last couple of months because of the efforts that are put in by the rest of the squad, and it's just we are so thankful to to, to the efforts from everybody, and and uh, that's going to make everybody better for Sunday. Brilliant. Bobby, thanks so much for joining us. We realise how busy you are this week in the build up to Sunday. So from everyone here in the start, the very best to look on Sunday and hopefully hopefully Cork will get the win that we all want. Yeah, thanks very much, Karen. Take care. Good Brilliant. Day. Cheers, Bobby. Thanks for that. Appreciate your time. Okay. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you for listening to the Star Sports Podcast. Don't forget to pick up this week's Southern Star featuring our award winning sports section. That is everything a sports fan in West Cork could want. Available every Thursday in shops across West Cork and online from anywhere in the world. The Southern Star, number one, 
for sport in West Cork. At Croke Park last Sunday, the Cork ladies footballers were beaten by Dublin in an All-Ireland semi-final, bringing the curtain down on Efi Fitzgerald's four years in charge. In that time, he guided the side to one All-Ireland title, three Munster titles and three Division 1 league titles. We're going to hear from him in a minute, but Kieran first, a disappointing end to the season for the Cork ladies. They were beaten by seven points, but the game was a lot closer than that. It was, yeah, and I tipped um, I tipped the Cork ladies to beat Dublin this time. I thought they had enough in their, their armory and arsenal to get the better of the Dubs, but it just, they just didn't play well in the second half. It was level at half time, seven points apiece, um, but it was Dublin who kept on it in the second half, not Cork. For some reason, they just never just, just never got going. Maybe it's because Dublin are the better team. Maybe that's it's as simple as that. This is a Dublin team that's that's chasing uh, three in a row under a very, very good side. But um, Cork will have regrets. Um, they missed a couple of chances. They had one or two goal chances that they didn't take. Dublin had a couple of goal chances. They took them. They scored two goals in, in the second half. I know that's probably making it sound very simplistic, but it does come down to those big games, come down to big moments. Um, Anya Terry O'Sullivan saw, saw a shot just trickle wide um, probably just 10, 11 minutes into the, the second half. A couple of minutes later, Dublin got their first goal. All of a sudden, Dublin were four points ahead and they didn't look back after that. Um, like I said, Cork will have regrets that they didn't play well. Um, we even interviewed Emer Skelly in this week's star and Emer was kind of almost lamenting the fact that Cork just they don't know what happened to them. They just didn't, they had a game plan, they went out there to execute a game plan, but it just didn't happen for, for one reason. But, um, but just on, on that point then, um, I, I didn't actually get to watch the match live, but I was listening to it on RT Radio 1 and the big talking point during the game and after the game was that all six of Dublin's forwards managed to get on the score sheet whereas Cork as has been the case uh, a lot of the time this season were over-reliant on on Orla Finn who was uh, on the freeze so when your forwards aren't scoring mm. it's difficult especially in a game of that magnitude That's a great point Jack and even just looking at it here Cork finished with 11 points Orla Finn got 9 points 8 of those are from freeze that means Cork got what? Two, two, two or three points. Oh, sorry, they finished with twelve points, so they got two point. They got three points from play. Emer Skelly, uh, Darren O'Sullivan, and Orr got one herself. Three points from play will never ever win you in an Ireland semi final. No. Um, and when you consider the the attack and talent and power that the Cork team has, you know it's kind of um, it's it's positive in a way that they were limited to just three points from from play. But um, if you go back to Leicester's All Ireland Ar- Ar- final too. The forwards struggled to score from play as well. Anya Terry was Cork's best player in the last year's All Ireland final. Um, she didn't score from play at all this year. She only came on for the last 20 minutes. But when you're looking at the likes of Dion O'Sullivan, Searson Noonan, Emer Scali, Orla Finn, Kira O'Sullivan, and to think that they just managed three points from play between them, it's just um, yeah, it's it's just not good enough when it when it comes to the to the big to the big stage like that. Um, the question now is, with Evie Fitzgerald gone, the new manager, whoever that'll be, is coming in. But he's coming into a very strong panel. It's a very young panel too. Um, Evie made a point afterwards that I think there's only there's only six or seven from the 2016 team still involved this year. Um, so he's overseeing a real building, a kind of transitional phase in the Cork ladies, Cork ladies football from that all conquering team. Go back that they, they dominated football for for a decade. Your Rena Buckley's, Bridge Corkery's, Deirdre O'Reilly's, these players. So. Um, it's it's a, it's a far different Cork team now, but there's a lot of young players there, um, and even the likes of Neve Cotter and the Kylies, the kind of they were playing in Croke Park, I think, for the first time in a championship game um, last Sunday. So it's kind of a young team, and there's still a lot lot more to come from them, I think, anyway. But it's very important that the senior players, the likes of Kiro Sullivan, Martin O'Brien, Orla Finn, these players, they, they, they just keep going because they're the leaders on this team. Um, but they're down at the moment, but they're they're not out, Jack. But as we mentioned, a disappointing end to the season and in some ways the end of an era as Aoife Fitzgerald departs stage right and he spoke to Kieran about his four years in charge of the Cork Ladies a little earlier on. We're delighted to be joined at the Star Sport podcast by Aoife Fitzgerald. Aoife, only one place to start um, in the aftermath of the All-Ireland semi-final defeat on Sunday to Dublin. You announced that you were stepping down as... Cork Lady Senior Football Manager. Um, what was the thinking behind that decision, Ify? And how long ago did you did you realise that this would be your last year in charge? Um, well, I suppose I was I was contemplating last year, um, but I decided I'd give it another go. Like they're a very young team, and that's when I said I'd give them another I'd give it another twelve months. So, um, so I suppose it was in my mind for a while, to be honest. But, um, but I, 
you know, I, I, the reason I did it Sunday was I wanted the players. I probably wouldn't have those players together again as a group. Um, so I wanted to tell them, and you know, once you, once you, once you say that, it just becomes public knowledge. Then, so, um, but, um, but I suppose I decided a while back that, um, you know, that probably that that would be my last year, and, um, and, um, but I'm very pleased. I have to say, I'm very pleased that, the, you know, the last four years has been highly enjoyable. You know, it's a great bunch. Like there's been there's been big changes during the time, and you know, and I, I think. You know, obviously there's a lot of work involved, but there's, there's, I think there's a bright future there for Cork, but it's hard work. And, you know, when you look at the level of Dublin and that in terms of their physicality and, and strength and conditioning and stuff, it's um, it's difficult to match um, for a number of reasons. But um, but all in all, I think we're we're still very, very competitive and we've been winning trophies. We've been consistently winning trophies. And I think that's testament to the girls, particularly the, the younger ones who have come in fairly seamlessly and, and, and done a great job. <laughs> Like you said, every face force, like, it's four years in charge, and like it was always going to be a big job for her name and right, but you've done a superb job, like winning not in Ireland, it's a three leagues, three monster titles, and that's that's at a time when this team has has been in transition, you could say, kind of. I think you mentioned after on Sunday that is it only seven of the twenty sixteen panel are still involved now, so that just shows, I suppose, the kind of the overhaul of players. Yeah, you know? yeah, well, yeah, well, everything is kind of a cycle. Like I mean, no matter what sport you look at, it, like if you look at United and the, you know for the last. 25 years, well, Ferguson was there, you know, a great success, and then you had the Liverpools before that, and, you know, but I suppose when you have, when you have great players, like Cork have had over the, over the years, and had great success, you know, there comes a time when the conveyor belt isn't, isn't, you know, isn't, I suppose, as, as fluent as it, as it used to be, and that, like, players can play for a generation, really, if they're, that, if they're interested, committed, they can play for a generation, and all the Cork girls were, were very, very good, so, when they all went, I suppose initially, you know, they went in maybe once or two, but then there was a big, big drop off, and you know, I suppose you you can kind of sustain one or two when you when you lose um, six or seven, then it becomes, you know, it becomes a big change, and um, and I think that that was what we needed to manage, like the success of, of the previous era was, you know, was fantastic, and but again, that that was an era in a sense, so it was just a case of trying to. Trying to manage that and make sure that the girls coming through were, were um, you know, my, my aim has always been to get the max out of the girls, but on and off the pitch, and uh, you know, winning is fine, and you know, we've won plenty of trophies, but it's it's just uh, trying to get the most and and be there for the girls, and you know, in in any way possible, and and I think as I say, we have a wonderful bunch, and and hopefully more young ones coming through as well, that you know, with with proper guidance, and that would be. Um, We'll take it on to the next level, and hopefully in a year or two will be will be. I mean, I think we're still very competitive. And again, on Sunday, you know, if Anya Terry's one had gone in, who knows? Sort of put us two points up. We had a couple of goal chances the first half. So you know, they're very small margins. Um, you know, the you know, I suppose I'm going into the match now, but the, the you know the yellow card, this particularly Marini's yellow card, had, had a big impact on the game. I felt um, you know, Dublin were able to come at us, and you know, their their strength and their power. Last quarter or they were was, was evident, but all in all, I think it was a very competitive game, and you know we we went up there to win, and hopefully you know very focused on, on trying to win, but we just felt a little bit short, but um, but there are no reasons for that, but I I, I do think uh, that I have to be satisfied with you know with how things have gone because I I don't think the girls could give me any more. I think we've seen a definite improvement in this Cork team even over the last couple of seasons and like Dublin are I suppose the pace setters at the moment they're going for, for three in a row but Cork have really pushed them for, for the last couple of years how, how far do you think Cork are off Dublin and what do Cork need to do I suppose to, to, to bridge that gap that's there right now you think? Well I don't think in, in lots of ways I don't think the gap can be bridged in terms of like if you look at the ge- geographical side of it, now Dublin girls are all bit of Barnwell Healy this year. All the Dublin girls are based in Dublin. They're probably within 45 minutes of their training ground, and so they can train collectively. They can do their their gym work collectively and their field work collectively. Whereas we would be, you know, we'd have girls scattered all over the place, and it's very difficult to coordinate, it, particularly from the point of view of the the strength and conditioning side of it, because you know it's very technical work and. You know, with the best will in the world, like we had, Kevin Tappen has been absolutely brilliant with us, um, looking after the conditioning side of it. But when he's not there, it can be very difficult to to, to know whether the girls are doing properly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, so there's, 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 you know, the, the distances the girls have to travel to training as well. I mean, the dis- even on Sunday going to the match, we went up on the day of Sunday because the girls wanted that. But some of them had to travel from West Cork 
is the cock to get a bonus to go up. Now, whether that's a factor or not in terms of us, you know, getting tired in the end of it, who knows? It's, it's difficult to know, but but it's very hard to get to that level of of, um, of conditioning. And as well as that, then, I mean, I, I you know, I I can't really comment on, on, on in terms of um, what kind of funding they... The, the Dublin girls are getting to, to prepare, but you know our county board here do their level best. But it's a it's a difficult job, and it's because you know the funding in, in the ladies' game isn't isn't great because of the crowds. You know we just don't get the crowds at the matches and that. So, um, so like we will be from a football point of view. I don't think there's anything really much between the between the teams, but from from the collective and you know get, getting people together and that it's, it's uh, probably a different ball game. Um, the, the biggest, the, the, I suppose the most upsetting thing for me over the period would be the, the standard of refereeing. Mm-hmm. I think it's, you know, I, it's crazy, to be honest, all the time. Some of the decisions, you know, I have no, I have no problem. I'm like, every, I'm not questioning any referee's integrity, but like some of the stuff that goes on and some of the decisions that are made, I just find it very hard to, when you have girls going, like Kira has been sent off there by you mm-hmm. wouldn't, by Maggie, what's her name, Farley for the last three matches. Now Kira's not a doctor player, but in such an imagination. Yeah. Three in a row. So you know when you look at things like that, and the meanie, the meanie thing the other day, the, 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 the tackle she was supposed to set sins in for, you know those those things. They amaze me at times, to be honest about it. And that's not being, you know, negative about us losing and all of that. It's it's, it's nothing to do with that. But that has been a trend. And I, I look at matches, and you know, you look at the Mayo match, the the, the previous to that, the Mayo Galway match, and you can go back over over lots of games. I, I just don't know, and I've asked the LGFA several times to define what's a tackle, what's a tick, what constitutes getting a tick, um, is every foul a tick, and nobody seems to be able to give us an answer. You know, that and that's for me. For, uh, what, I'm so sorry if he's going to say, is, sorry. Is, is, is that actually something that the LGFA should look at going forward, just to try, like you said, define the tackle, like for the rules to be a, a, a lot more clearer? Because I actually heard something during the week as well, I think it was listening to Off the Ball and News Talk, and... And there was someone on there yeah. saying that um, that that when matches have been televised, that there's a referee inside with the with the with, with the match day kind of television studio, and they're actually watching the game too, and they're they're in contact with the referee. I'd never heard that before. They didn't even know that that existed. It's almost a type no. of type of VAR, and I'd never heard it. You know, so it's kind of it's those little bit of inconsistencies that we probably don't know what's going on. Yeah, and and as well as that, I mean, when you're looking at a game as tight as Sunday as one was. You know, yellow cards are going to have a major impact. And, you know, like up to the point of, of Emer being sent off, Dublin didn't create a chance, a goal chance. When she did, now I know you could argue that their girl was sent off as well. But, like, when she came back on, they were able to run at it. And it, it does, like, that 10 minutes has a major impact, particularly on the way we set up in that, has a major impact on, on the game itself. No, did it warrant that? It didn't. I mean, we played more or less 20 minutes of the second half with 14 players. Um, and I don't, I don't think, you know, I don't think it was warranted. No, no, that's us. That goes on in, in lots of games, you know. Um, so from the point of view, when you're going out, when you're going out in a championship match, what you want to be able to do is go with a reason. I mean, obviously, if there's a very bad tackle, if, if it needs to be a look at, fair enough, if it's a very obvious thing. But, but like for, for things that I would consider as being fairly trivial and for, for contact, I mean, if you look at some of the contact on Sunday that wasn't uh, picked up on, and then Emer got, you know, got the ticks for what I would say was re- relatively innocuous. Maybe one you could say, agree, yeah. But uh, but like the impact that had, the overall impact had on the game, I think was was a lot more than what the punishment merited, you know. So and that's the problem. I think that's a problem, you know, not just in relation to Sunday, but that's a problem going far for the LGFA. I mean, you you talk about yellow cat. Like, are they are they going to let it go? Because it's different referee referees' interpretations of it. Mm-hmm. Some referees will let things go, which is fair enough if 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 if, if it's like that. And other referees then will be very finicky, and then you can end up with two or three in the, in the same. But like we had we had Maggie as well as it happened for the league final, and Ashley Hutchins got a got a, a yellow car for 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 nothing in my opinion, you know. So that it goes on, and we had two sent off in the last ten minutes of that as well. And these things are they heavily impact on on games, so. And like then, as I say, fair enough. If they're if they're very obvious and they're very, you know, that that, that it merits maybe a sending off or whatever, but not for, not for what I would say is, but but the referee's interpretation of, of two ticks because two ticks can be anything. I mean, some girls. I I have stats that are not going to go into individual players, but stats where some girls were able to make ten or eleven fouls and 
not be sent off. I know the girls were able to do two or three an, an hour. No, that's not Sunday. That's going back over time. That that can't be right, you know, because we keep stats on everything, and it's it's very difficult to 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 look at that and say, well, you know. And I've asked referees mm-hmm. as well as asking the ALGF. I've asked referees what exactly is a tick, and you will get different answers um, to different questions. So, um, you know, but they're they're in like the problem. I think that's the problem going forward for the ALGF. That's for me the the standard of refereeing and the the definition of the of the tackle and what constitutes yellow cards has to be looked at because the game, whether they like it or not, the game is getting more physical mm-hmm. and with the strength and conditioning stuff and that, it's, it is, I suppose, it's morphing into more like the men's game in the sense that it's, it's um, you need to be very, very fit now. Um, I mean, taking us as an example, our girls would have trained five days, five days a week, three times with us and twice individually with their, with their gym work. So, and that's outside club, that's outside club stuff. So, like it is a very, very um, high intensity game now, and you, you do, you do. I say you need to be very, very fit. But I do think that the the punishment needs to meet the crime rather than you know games being being spoiled by by what I would consider sometimes unnecessary yellow cards. After your four years, so if in charge, do, do, do you think you're finishing up as as a better manager than when you start when you started? Like, what have you learned through the past four years with the Cork team? I know. All I think as manager, no matter how long you got, like I'd be a completely different manager to us than I am when I started with with Nemo or whatever. It'd be, you know, my things have changed. Society has changed. People have changed. You know, I mean the days for the, you know, the, the balling and roaring are long gone. I mean, mm-hmm. half time now and part of the match consists of more stats and, you know, you're trying to figure out in a short space of time how, you know, things are going well, things that we can improve on. So it's become, I suppose, it's become. Uh, Emotional and more academic in lots of ways, mm-hmm. um, and that's fair enough too. But you know, with the amount of technology we have available to us now, there's very little goes on the pitch that we can't identify pretty much early. And you know, whilst I wouldn't be that off air with the technology myself, I certainly use it. Um, you know, we have Leonard Brown and from UCC who who did an awful lot of our analysis for us there, and he's on unbelievable stuff. You know, mm-hmm. so you get a lot of that. But that's that's the stats element of it. But I do think it is very helpful, particularly at halftime. You know. Like when we when I started managing first to be come on like things weren't going well you go and you give maybe give a few fellas a bit of a bollocking and you you know and you rose the troops and that but I think we we've kind of developed on from that stage now and it's more as I say it's more technical and you're you're looking at you know different areas as to how you can improve um you know both offensively and defensively and and I think that's to be welcome because at the end of the day everybody starts the game and they play it to to enjoy it and. You know, I suppose we were brought up in an era where it was doggy dog and you, you fought for every corner and you didn't have that analysis. You know, you might have a fell on the line taking a couple of stats for you, you know, how many scores you missed and that kind of stuff. Nowadays, it, it's gone far more technical than that. So so from my own point of view, I suppose that's, that's been a development for me. And, you know, I'd be very, uh, I suppose, no, with ladies, it's obviously a little bit different. Mm-hmm. I would be much, cool, much cooler on the line. And I'd probably more, much more, I'm looking at, you know, what's going on in the game now rather than enjoying the game. Uh, at least I try to be anyway. You know, sometimes, particularly when you're, when you're in my younger days of management, you're kind of trying to enjoy the game as well as, as you know, as, as manage. And, you know, nowadays I'd be attempting to look at what's actually happening in different situations and, and trying to analyse in my own head. Well, listen, is this happening? Can we improve this? Or, you know, do we need to do something different? Um, that kind of stuff. And, and as well as that, probably not to be... I wouldn't be as impulsive as I was. You know, somebody misses two or three balls, you know, I say, oh, geez, do we need to replace him or her or whatever? Mm-hmm. Like, it's, um, it's, more, it's more measured now and you're, you're looking at things over more a longer period of time rather than over, say, 10, 15 minutes, which, you know, which at the start I tend to do. So all in all, I'd say probably age brings out a little bit of that as well. But I'd be more relaxed in my, in my attitude to the thing. And I think the one thing you have to avoid as a manager, um, particularly after you've played, played um, is you know, that you never made a mistake yourself because you want the best for everybody and you want the best for your team and not to be overcritical of people, you know, because everybody's different and, you know, you have to treat everybody individually. Like some people can do with a little bit of a, a little bit of a G up from time to time, but others then, if you do that, they, you know, they, they will. So it's, it's more encouragement than that. And I think with the girls, you know, the girls are, it's been, you know, it's been a hugely positive experience, I have to say. Like they're so committed, those girls, and, you know, and another thing that disappointed me about Sunday was, and this is to do with the LGFA as well, but like the girls didn't get any free tickets for the match, which I think is unheard of. Oh, you know, like, 
like I, I just think that's grossly unfair. Like they have parents, like we have parents who are driving these girls to training, bringing them home, you know, doing uh, at, a, at a fair cost to themselves, their families. Um, and not to provide them with two complimentary tickets each, I think was just absolutely ludicrous. No, I, I, I rang the LGFA about it, but they just told us there, there wasn't, there wasn't any. And these are, these are small things, but they're big things as well. And I think it's a, for me, it's a lack of respect for the girls. You know, it, it wouldn't happen for sure. Mm-hmm wouldn't happen in the men's game, nor should it happen, by the way. I mean, when if somebody's gone on there, that was on national television on, on Sunday, if the girls who, and our girls, don't get a penny in expenses, uh, we don't take expenses. I never take expenses for my travel to training or, or, or that kind of stuff. So, like, if you're not entitled to a couple of free tickets to bring your family or parents or, or whatever, then I think there's something radically wrong, you know? And that, that that's something I think that, you know, my, my own idea on it, to be honest about it, is that the, the ladies' football needs to amalgamate with the GA uh, full stop. Our, the growth has been massive, but I think the growth will be stymied, and it will probably decrease um, in terms of popularity if that marriage doesn't, uh, marry doesn't take place, because I do think it would be a fantastic product, the, the ladies before the men's games. It would be an absolutely fantastic product. And you're never, in my opinion, in my lifetime anyway, I don't think you're ever going to get to a stage where you're going to have Massive crowds at ladies' matches. Mm-hmm. Now, all right for the All Ireland final, maybe they'll be looking at getting getting big numbers again. But I would say that a lot of those are kids, and they're being brought by you know they're being brought by families, and maybe getting in for free and stuff. I I don't know, but you know, in general terms, if you look at the if you look at the leagues and look at the provincial championships and and even the the earlier rounds of the of the All Ireland series, the crowds are abysmal. They're absolutely abysmal. So it's not being supported um, by I suppose particularly by ladies, um, but in general, you you you'll get families at matches, and you'll get a few, you know. We and to be fair to Cork, we have some really great supporters who 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 visit all our matches. But but that's you know you're talking maybe a couple of hundred people, um, and even Dublin, with the Dublin, if you take them outside of the capital, you have very very few at their games as well, you know. So so that is a big problem going forward, and I think it's something that if if they are going to be serious about about moving this on to another level, then that has to be addressed. And as do the expenses for the girls, you know, because there's not a girl in our panel there who hasn't been seriously out of pocket for the year um, for representing their county. And and I will say as well that our county board are, are were absolutely fantastic. You know, where anything we asked for, within reason, we got, you know, in as much as they could do for us. So I'd have absolutely no no issues there, but it's just that the funding, the funding isn't there. So... And the only way to address that is to is is to be compared to the the bigger organisation, in my opinion. And you're leaving this team, Ify, in in a very strong position. Even um, I suppose we look at the football side of it, the likes of the likes of the two Coydies, Emer and Darren, like Melissa Duggan, um, even Eve Cotter got to play in Crow Park last Sunday. Kind of they're, they're, they're just some of them, but there's a very strong young core coming up to kind of complement the likes of Kiro Sullivan, Martina, or the and that. So kind of your successor, wherever that will be, kind of they have a very good base to build on, haven't they? Absolutely, and I mean, I was thrilled the Coyleys have developed. But you know, even like we we changed Hannah Looney, made a full back all over, mm-hmm. and on Sunday I thought she was absolutely magnificent. You know, um, like we've tried things, we've changed, we've changed Ashton Hutchins so many times, and it's just trying to fit girls into into positions that would suit a new team in a sense. So that was very enjoyable as well, trying to get the best out of all of the girls we had. I mean, Kira was probably the only one that was really established on the previous, you know, during Eamon's time. So the girls that were coming in even though some of them had been on the panel, would have been kind of fringe players. And to see their, their development, you know, I, the likes of Mauro Callaghan and, and, you know, Ashling. Um, no, I know Ashling had been on and off, but like Orla Finn even, you know, like their, their, their development over the last few years has been, like that's been a great source of, of um, I suppose, encouragement for me, number one, and, and number two, the, the satisfaction that, you know, they develop so much and that they're, they really are. Not alone are they, are they excellent footballers, but they're great people as well. You know, and that's the most important thing. I think when you finish up, that you know you've made great friends out of it, and and you know, it, it may take Cork another year or two to win an All Ireland, and it may not happen for a while. Who knows? But I think once you're knocking on the door, and you know, it is going to be no matter what you say. Once Dublin are organised, it it gets more difficult, um, for the reasons we 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 outlined earlier there. But it, but like we have such a committed and passionate group of. Of players and you know it's it's fantastic and I do hope I do hope going forward that they you know that that they will achieve success. But I mean to 
you know, even to win the league this year was a big bonus for, mm-hmm. for, for some of the younger girls, you know. I mean, if you look at the, the Mayos and the Galways and these the so-called bigger teams, they haven't won a hell of a lot over over time and our girls who have come, come along. And I do do think that Peter Lee, he actually has done a magnificent job with Mayo in light of the turnover um, that he's had as well over the over the couple of years. And, and there's been great, I suppose, camaraderie amongst the managers as well, you know, for the most part that, you know, we, you know, it, it, I must say it's been a thoroughly enjoyable experience from that, from that point of view. And going around the country and meeting people, you know, and really die hard, what you call GA people who are, you know, putting out the flags and, and meeting at ground and that. And it's been, it's been largely a, a very positive experience. But, but from the point of view of the development of our girls, it's just a case that they need to really, really work hard and, and, and commit to it. I mean, it, it, is, it is a lifestyle choice, no matter what anybody says. I mean, the, the playing is the easy part. But looking after your nutrition, getting enough of sleep, not going out when your friends are going out, um, making sure that you're, you know, you get enough rest between training sessions. It it is, for all intents and purposes, a professional. You're 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 treating yourself as a professional in an amateur game. So that takes huge effort and commitment. And you know, whilst the, the you know the the all Ireland is the gold standard at the end of it, we all accept that. But like, if you're getting the max out of yourself, and and I think that's what pleased me most about the girls, if you're getting the max out of yourself. Um, and in any particular day and any particular season and you go and you can look yourself in the mirror at the end and say listen I gave it my best and you know I'm very very pleased with that and as I say I'm extremely pleased with, with the contribution that the girls have made to my, during my time there Final question Aoife because you've been so generous with, with, with your time um, is there danger with Dublin go for three in a row that we could have the Dublin ladies kind of almost imitating what the Dublin men have done dominating the men's football like the Dublin ladies after they're, they're a step ahead of everyone else at the moment and they are going for the three in a row kind of is there danger that they could dominate for the next couple of years the way that well, the Dublin again, like, yeah, going back to the generation thing that possibly is now, now to be fair to those Dublin girls a lot of them are on the road 10, 12 years if you look at Lindsay Davy and Maeve McAvoy and, and Noel Healy you know um, who was the older girls they, they, have, they have been there 10, 12 years maybe, you know, so, mm-hmm. like, and they have lost three or four All-Irelands before they, before they managed to win one, you know, um, Sinead Heron as well, like, so they're, you know, how long they can keep going, who knows, but I suppose they're building a little bit of a base and they're playing with confidence now that maybe they didn't have, I mean, a lot of their games at Cork over the years were very tight anyway, and Cork seemed to come out the right side of it, but I think that, that Cork, you know, the, the, the great Cork teams we say had, had that physicality that we're probably lacking a little bit at the moment. They, they were naturally strong girls. Like if you look at Angela Walsh and, you know, Breed Stack and, and Rena and, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Julie Muff, they were all big girls, big strong girls naturally. You know, so, they, you know, they, that I think what we're producing at the moment is the girls outside Nave Cot, who's quite a tall lady, but like the girls aren't naturally what you call naturally very strong. So that's something that needs to be built up over time. And I think that's probably one of the areas that Dublin had over us and that they they have probably 10 years spent in conditioning behind them. A lot of those girls um, and some of ours are there maybe second, first, second, third year, which makes makes a difference. And their power shone through really in the last in the last 10, 15 minutes. So, but that could definitely only come with time and with dedication and that. But I do hope that, you know, that, you know, over time that our girls will stick at it and that they will, you know, that they will, you know, progress even further because I do think the football ability is there. There's no doubt in that. Um, and once they do that, then I think we're in there with every chance. Do I think they could dominate? They, I, I don't know. You know, it's very difficult to say. If, if some of those girls go, will the girls coming through be as good? You, you just never know. Um, but they'll certainly always be very competitive because of the, I mean, if you look at this, what, about 5 million people in Dublin, is it roughly? Once they're organised, um, and, and get themselves together similar to what the men do then it's going to be very difficult if you look at the logic of it you know out of, out of that many people you're going to get a certain amount of, of very good players so um, but that's I suppose that's just a challenge for us all you just have to keep at it and keep plugging away I mean I would have, who would have thought that Kerry going into the game on Sunday you know I think they're 3-1 to one against Dublin 6-1 to one on like uh, 10 years ago would you have said that not a hope so I think if Dublin are organised, then it's going to be very, very difficult for, for anybody to beat them in, in, in any code, you know, because, they, as I said, because of the population and they're geographically located together and all of that. It's going to be very, very difficult. So maybe it can cause a problem for the J going forward as well, because if they do win on Sunday, um, you know, you're looking at next year and you're thinking, well, geez, they'll, they'll bring in one or two more and, and, you know, how long is this going to go on for? So maybe down the line, they'll probably have to look at splitting it up maybe or something, I don't know, because I think... As far as I'm aware, there's about 87,000 people in Tottenham, Kerry, and sure you'd have that 
in Dublin that would, that would be a small parish, you know. So and they, I mean they're a beautiful team to watch. There's no disputing their their talents. I mean I love watching them. They're absolutely, you know, and I've seen them in action when involved with Clare. They they can mount the players and they're off the field. They're exemplary. I mean they're a credit to the management. There's absolute credit. So 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 you have to say you know take a head off to them at times, but. I don't think it's good for the game the long term. You know, if 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 that domination continues, it's just going to, you know, who's going to want to play play with the county if you know, if you have no chance of being yeah. not not alone successful, but if you're going to go out and get a hiding every every time you play them, you know, it's it's going to be very difficult. You know, so so I hope I hope that you know in Sunday that it will be a good game. But, you know, but you, it's very hard to see past Dublin at the same time. Thank you for listening to the Star Sports Podcast. Don't forget to pick up this week's Southern Star featuring our award-winning sports section that has everything a sports fan in West Cork could want. Available every Thursday in shops across West Cork and online from anywhere in the world. The Southern Star, number one for sport in West Cork. Welcome back to the Star Sport Podcast. Before we take a look at what to expect in this week's Southern Star, there is a small matter of the West Cork League getting underway this weekend. One of the biggest stories to watch out for this season is the amalgamation of the two Clannacilty sides, and Jer McCarthy caught up with Clannacilty town manager John Leahy at the season's launch last weekend. John Leahy, uh, the fact that the two Clannacilty teams, there's one senior team in the top division this year. Um, first of all, Clannacilty town are in existence over 14 years, Clannacilty AFC much longer, but the fact that the Clannacilty AFC players have joined your squad now for the coming season like that's a very very strong squad you have in what's going to be a very competitive league. Yeah, great, great to see two teams come together and hopefully uh, start with something great for the town of and of soccer and Clannig and get it back to the good old days as we had years ago. So it helps both clubs I think because we've been weak at the start of the season and this could help us out fantastically. But we're now we could have a strong panel of twenty players which we need badly because we started poor last year. AFC started poor, finished strong. So hopefully and we're all friends and. So to go to soccer, really, in Clan, we need to com- competitive with teams in the West Cork League. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's going to be a competitive league, an extremely competitive league that you know as well as I do. But I mean, the fact that Clan Kilty having a competitive team and maybe challenging for a couple of trophies before the end of the season, maybe, um, would be a good thing and a good boost for the town. Oh yeah, for soccer and Clan, especially because the underage setup in AFC alone from under 12 down is absolutely fantastic. I mean, one of the best underage setups I've seen in a long time, and are brilliant to the kids. But yeah, we're going to win something this year. I'll talk to you again at the end of the season. We will win something this year. That's how confident I am and the players we have and the confidence they're showing already in training and everything. Like Clantown training, this is doesn't happen like. And even the GL that's not involved in the G at the moment, they've been texting me, we'll all be back, we'll all be back, we're all back once the J's over. Um, and from your point of view, it's going to be a nice problem to have in that you're going to have difficulty in picking a team, hopefully every Sunday. And the fact that you've picked, you know better than anyone, you need a big squad. You just can't survive without one. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Like, as I said, and uh, my old buddies in Belly have, our friends, they had five good subs to bring on last year and they were competitive. But um, Party Horn is helping me out this year, so myself and Party will have a hard job so I can barely see past the book to Party the whole time. <laughs> Eight teams, eight teams with an awful lot of potential. Obviously, at the start of the year, everyone's on the same kind of plane, but who do you expect to challenge? Oh, actually, I was thinking about this question last night because I heard this was coming up. Top of my head, the men with town again because their senior footballers out of football and their hurlers are out, definitely. But Beldy Hobb again, but my surprise back, I think Torre Celtic this year, I think. I really do think Torre Celtic will win the league this year. If not, Clannock Hilti Town will win it. Very good. You can see the boost you get from winning a trophy like they got and they were excellent in the Michael Cronin Cup this week but four goals past a very good Manway team um, how important is it to get off to a good start? Oh vital any time like I'm ex-Clan AFC myself and Clan Town we won stuff your first five games is that your, that your see we lost our first four games last year and it was catch up and we God, we only barely survived like due to playoffs which the playoff I think is a great thing just because we survived last year but it makes this year with the new changes in the championship this is going to be, I think, one of the best years for West Cork League soccer. Hopefully, the weather will help us all out, but it should be a great year. The fact there's only eight teams in the top flight means there's no, you can't, you've no, you've no room for slip up, really. None whatsoever. Like the, the bottom two, and well, there's a playoff again, but it's you, you cannot slip up. I mean, oh, the fixtures are coming out. I'm already thinking ahead, like for next week, and uh, it's just going to. We have to win. You have to start your first four games, five games. If you're in, you're there for the whole season. 
and if you lose two or three, it's, it's going to be so tight. I think there'll be no point. I think between top and bottom this year, I think there'll only be seven, eight points, I think, personally myself. And where will Clanton finish? Third. First year, win it next year. Ger also caught up with Tim O'Donovan, chairman of the West Cork League, to preview the season ahead. Tim O'Donovan, chairman of the West Cork League. Um, a successful launch night, first of all. Fantastic to see it go off so well, so well organised by you and the committee, but also to see it so well attended by nearly every club competing this year, a positive start to the new season. Yes, it was fantastic and um, the biggest crowd we had in a long time. Um, this was new to me. I hadn't been at lunch before. i seen lunches, I'd read about them. But when Mike Helen said this to me a couple months ago, I said, Mike, go for it. Um, Mike's the man. Um, fantastic addition to the committee. Every club was eager tonight, willing to talk. And they all gave their time freely, which was fantastic. And it just showed how much they like playing soccer. And soccer is big in West Cork. We're making a comeback again. You know, We had a few lean years, but... I think there's a new gang of players out there and we'll have to give them a benefit of the doubt, you know, just they have to play. It's a fantastic pastime. You know, the winter is coming and you know, pass away Sunday evenings and that's what it's all about. They're enjoying their soccer, so it's fantastic and the will to win is great. And um, one of the features that everyone is talking about is how tight both leagues are likely to be this year. The Premier's got eight clubs and it, the championship's got ten. No giveaway games, you've got to be on it most weeks, and hopefully that, that will lead to a lot of competitive games and attract a few people that don't normally go to West Cork League matches. Great point, great point. Um, it is very close. You look at, when you look, just look at the fixtures, you say it's even hard to pick a winner. Um, you have to go around through the fixture. I was looking at it, I said, Oh my god, who, who's going to win this? Is you know, it's it's nearly impossible. You, I, I couldn't pick any winner of anyone. I suppose a lot will depend on the teams at the start of the season if they can promote their full teams. Because if you go back a good few seasons ago, I remember when Drina started, um, they used to win their league in the first five games because teams were a little organised. But I know we've come a long way and the majority of teams are well organised, but there might be a few J games on and they might have a few players missing. If that happens, that could cost a top team the league. So don't be surprised if a top team that we're talking about tonight will be short four points, three points, even one point at the end. And the winner of this league... I reckon, will be in the first three games. That's what I think will happen. One of the best features about the West Cork League is the fact that the teams are spread over such a wide area, from Mizzen uh, all the way to back over to Clan, back over to Dunmanway, and back over to Skibbereen and Baltimore. Um, it's a fantastic spread, and it just shows you the popularity is continues to grow. It does, it does. Um, it's fantastic. I, I, even though saying that, I would still like to see a team down the Bear Peninsula. Uh, there's a huge cavity down there. We had a great team down there. Maybe, you know, we still have a few pockets that I'm not happy with and we are still thriving. Mike did a lot of work and John Buckley. Um, there were the last three weeks we were trying to get teams back, but, you know, we still keep working at it. Um, we're trying to encourage everybody. There's a huge area in Midcock that soccer died and it's coming again. Now there's a big area out, as I always say, if you sit in a car and you drive to Skibbereen, unfortunately, Arfield are coming. It'll take a year or two before their own age would click back in. There's another team in that area that has to be. We need to get a team back up in Bear Rovers. And if we can get one of the Bear Lapin and say, I'd be happy. You know, no. You know, it's maintaining what we have as well. Because a team has a bad year. It's hard to motivate them the following year. But looking at the close tonight, like, even the teams in the first division, like, there's a lot to play for there. The top six, the bottom six. I was involved last year. My son was involved in a lawyer. Very exciting. Um, pay the price because he couldn't get a team out but just look at it there's an awful lot to play for like to get into the top six you have a chance to get into the premiership anything could happen like you could struggle to get to number six you could win the playoffs and you could still get up but you know there's a lot to play for it's huge big excitement I'm delighted I'm thrilled to pieces the, um, tonight it went off fantastic so who knows what will happen but as I said I think the leagues will be deciding the first three games if, the, if, if there's points dropped I won't say full sheep that shouldn't have been dropped you only get one chance it's going to make it so exciting every game is going to be it's going to be tough for some of the teams there's no question about it you know um, no, I suppose we're all watching Doris Doris had a great year last year they beat Drina in the Carling League Cup and I actually think they could surprise because you know the guys that are up there already the regulars might think Ah, should have come up and you know we we'll teach them a lesson. But I just look at them. I said they were afraid nobody last year. They blew everybody out of the water. So I think they'll survive. And I think if they had a full team going out, they could surprise a lot of teams. And just finally, Tim, what are you most looking forward to? What are you hoping for? I suppose between here and the end of the season. I suppose you know every year I'm, I'm on this committee. You know, like some people, may say, my wife might say too long. You know, and it amazes me. 
every year something different pops his head. And it starts every year, I say to myself, what's going to be new? I, I'm not even going to comment on the stuff I'm talking about because this, a lot of this is discipline. But if you could get a season with very few red cards, um, good soccer played. Now, one thing that does annoy me is very bad conditions. Um you know, running out of time. I think it's so unfair on players having to play in real bad conditions. I presented cup with nearly two overcoats on me. Um, you know, I like that the league started. I really would like that the league started a week earlier if I could. And when the weather comes bad, I would love to take a break and start again. I know we're a winter league and we will always remain a winter league. But, you know, I, I always love to see Dun the Dog. Uh, winning. Um, I spoke there tonight about Bear Rovers. I imagine their first year in 1990 they entered this league. And I can remember at the time, um, they were, Belmont were the hottest of favourites. And I was at match down in Drina and I could not believe it. This didn't stop them. They stuck them man to man. They won it. And I would love to think that maybe some lower down division team would take one of the big guns by surprise if that happened. That'll make my year because if if a team from the lower division can win, take a scalp, a big scalp off a Premiership team, you'd be surprised the good that does for that team down there. No, the Premiership teams mightn't thank me for it, but that's what I would love to see. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Now, before we wrap up today's show and preview what to expect in this week's paper, we have a little competition to run. We've got some books to give away, Kieran. Yeah, what we have is. We have four books in total, two Cover Staunton and two Colm Cooch Cooper. What they are, these are great Irish sports stars. They're kids' books, Jack. They're, 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 um, they're GA books, kind of aim for kids. Fierce interesting. Um, so we have four to give away. Like I said, there's two about the Gooch and two about Cover Staunton. So we'll make this nice and simple, I think. Kind of Whoever wants these books, and you can see them here on our podcast if you're, if you're watching, um, just send us a quick email to sport at southernstar.ie with the subject head, I want a book. And the first four um, emails we get in, we'll ping a book out to you in the post. So it's, it's that simple. Subject head, I want a book. And email sport at southernstar.ie. Ideal for kids or anything, or even adults. Yeah, well, I spent about half an hour reading the, the story of the Gooch one day. And uh, I suppose I'm officially an adult. I might well, that's the act, like, yeah, I think, act yeah. like a child. Uh, but I enjoyed it. And uh, I'm sure... Any nieces, nephews, sons, daughters, or little cousins would love if they love GAA, they will love these books and we're giving them away for free. So get yeah. get in touch. Now, uh, just moving on from our freebies for a second, we're going to start selling to you because the Southern Star is out this Thursday, as it is every <laughs> Thursday, and um, it's two euros twenty in stores. Absolute bargain, especially yeah. when you take into account what's in it this week. And Kieran's about to tell us what's in it this week. It's action packed as usual, Jack. It's um, 28 pages of the very best of West Cork sport um, in the shops this Thursday morning. So, where to start? Um, like I was saying to Jack off camera earlier, I, I took one week off on holidays, and all of a sudden I come back, and the Cork Camogie team was lost, the Cork Ladies football team was lost, Castlehaven Road. Kirby Rangers are out and now Kilmackaby are out of the Junior Football Championship. So just on the Junior A Kirby Football Championship, we've a um, full report from Kilmackaby and Bellinascarty, which was the probably the shock of the championship so far, Jack. Um, Kilmackaby were going for the three in a row and probably had their sights set on the county. But Bellinascarty scored a goal, I think, seven or eight minutes into injury time. Wing back Kieran O'Neill, I hope I have his name right, is the Bellinascarty hero. So that sent Bell through to the Carberry um, Junior Football Semi-Final where they'll play Carberry Rangers so what we're guaranteed this year in Carberry is a new Carberry Junior Football Champion um, St. James is already in the final waiting to see who comes through in the Carberry Junior Hurling Championship Kilbury are the team to beat um, they were very very impressive beating Eustacetown last weekend so we have a full report on that um, we've obviously with the All-Ireland Minor Football Final coming up this weekend we have a big preview of Cork against Galway um, looking back on the Cork ladies last to to Dublin and we also caught up with one of the front runners for the now vacant ladies football job John Cleary to get his thoughts and to see if he is in the reckoning for the top job so you'll have to pick up Thursday Star to see what John says Um Senior football, Clan Kilty got the better of Donovan Rasa, and like we said earlier, Carby Rangers were knocked out. But they went down after Herculean effort against St. Finbar, so full reports on that. 
big a big event out west um out west west last weekend jack was the bearer junior football final against um garnish and orhan we have a two-page feature on that it's always a big deal um to bear football it's the showpiece game of the year so we we're, we're going big on that this week um huge win for for orhan they defeated kind of a uh, garnish who i think we're going for either the three or three or four in a row so that's that's big news so congrats to them we have a two-page preview of the west cork league like we said that kicks off th- this weekend so we have a club by club guide to the eight teams in the premier division so um there's no, no club by club guide for the championship not yet, um, not yet, but we, we'll do that. Obviously, if you don't know by now, Jack is uh, claims to be Baltimore's um, rock and rock and defence. But we'll see, Jack. You have a bit of pressure on this year, kind of predictions. Tough season ahead. Well, see, the problem is Island Rovers are still going strong in the Senior Football Championship, so that's a bit of a drawback for the soccer playing community. But uh, best luck to the Island Rovers lads, mm-hmm. nonetheless. But come back soon. <laughs> <laughs> and Island Rovers are actually in Championship action this weekend, so that's we, we have a preview of that. So... It is an action-packed um, sports section this week. And just to mention, too, that we have uh, reports from the Kinsale Ladies won the West Cork Division 1 Cup Final last week, last week against Bantry Blues. And also the West Cork Ladies defeated Aero Og in the County Senior Football Championship on Monday night in, in Ovens. And that's kind of a, an interesting one, Jack. It was just 27 hours after Cork lost to Dublin in that Ireland semi-final. Five of those um, Cork players lined out for West Cork. One of them, Emer Skelly, lined out for for Aero Oak. Um, Orla Finn was playing for Kinsale on Monday night in the county championship. She scored 2-11. She took out her frustrations on, on poor Ahadesh. She got 2-11 and 2-8 from that was from play. So um, incredible to think that, like I said, the following day after losing such a big game, play. that they're, they're back in club action. You know, kind of, personally, I think it's a bit too much, kind of, you know, kind of even the, the physical and emotional, I suppose, fallout of losing a big game and you're straight back into action or maybe there's a case of getting back in the horse again I don't know I would have preferred to see in a couple of days but um, we, we, we have all that and a lot lot more um, if we're talking about value for money this week Jack you won't get any better and if you can't get to a shop to buy it you can always buy it online w www.southernstar.ie forward slash e-paper and before Kieran you wrap up just to give a shout out to kill the matcher boxer Christina Desmond who is probably just arriving in the ring in the European Elite Women's Championships over in Madrid so best of luck to Christina too we'll best follow her progress it's the last 16 is her first round tie today superb fantastic going um, so again thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast we'll be back at the same time next week if you enjoy these shows please make sure to rate review and subscribe on iTunes Spotify YouTube Acast Stitcher or wherever else you listen to the show do do do. It was fine, that thing, no, that'd be.